welcome everybody um, to our second distinguished lecture today. Um, we're delighted to have Giliola Stefalani from MIT, um, about whom you can read very much that is extremely positive when you look at the web, look at the post. <laughs> so I will not repeat it. Um, but uh, she is a very distinguished mathematician. Um, and we're uh, delighted to have her with us today. She will talk on uh, wa the wave turbulence theory for a stochastic KDV type equation. So thank you very much, Deliola. Uh, oh, and to remind everybody that there is uh, more food, wine and cheese um, after the talk in that room. <laughs> Thank you, first of all, to you, Susan, for the invitation and also for you to come to the talk. Um, so this is uh, some recent, uh, not so recent work, that depends how uh, when we start counting about, with uh, my collaborator, Bing Tran, at the Texas a &M. works on this one. This is a little bit of uh, um, the summary of the talk. So a brief introduction of what we mean with energy transfer, which is one element of this uh, wave turbulence theory. Um, then there are two different approaches, one which is more deterministic, one which is more probabilistic. And I'm gonna, um, I started with the first one, in fact, a long time ago, and I will give you a little bit of an idea of that then setting up the problem that Bin and I worked on. And then we go a little bit deeper into the statement of the, of the theorem, which uh, um, is basically, I can anticipate, is finding in a rigorous way, the derivation of what we call wave kinetic equation. And in doing that, there are a few elements that are extremely important. One of them, since it's an probabilistic approach, a distribution function, um, statement of the result, and then a little bit about the um, remarks on the result itself and in the type of element that you have, tools that you use to prove this uh, rigorous derivation. So let's start with a little bit of an introduction of the energy transfer. Now, I learned this from Burgain, actually, when um, I was um, on the way to the IS and I was his postdoc for a year. And let me summarize a little bit what we mean with this energy transfer. So let's assume we start with a solution U, Tx, of a certain dispersive PD. So think about Schrodinger. That's no linear Schrodinger. That's a typical one, but there are other kinds, and I will, in fact, talk about a different kind today. Now, this solution U, you can think of it, um, well, um, as a wave. And let's us also assume that X lives in a certain manifold. Um, the type of results that I will be talking about today is something that does not happen if you do not have boundary conditions. So you should think about something that is either compact or with some boundary conditions. So um, we've thanks to the fact that we can use Fourier transfer, the best way to think about this to start with at least is uh, periodic situations. In other words, think of X to be in the torus of dimension B. Okay, so that's where we start. And then you can think about the Fourier coefficient. In fact, you can um, also look at the uh, PDE both in the physical space, but also in the fre frequency space. And in the frequency space happen to be, for example, you're thinking about NLS or KDV, happen to be an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system in which the uh, P and the Q, if you think about Hamiltonians, are the real imaginary part of the Fourier coefficient. So we think about the Fourier coefficient and uh, the question that we want to ask is the following. Suppose that at time zero, I start with uh, this Fourier coefficient, the, the size of it square, um, localized near small frequency. So can I, can I find um, initial data such that later on in time, that bump is gonna be moving towards a higher frequency uh, or not? And in particular, if this movement from low to high, um, how does it happen? Do we understand a little bit better than that? So for example, one thing that immediately comes to mind is the area of the subgraph. 
if you're thinking about the NLS, nonlinear Schrodinger, the L2 norm of the um, U, of the solution U is conserved, that's the mass. And the, via Planchard L, the area of the subgraph is exactly related to that. So, so if such a movement it certainly has to happen in a sort of controlled manner because, for example, the area of the subgraph has to stay constant. All right, so what is the one way of understanding whether you do have this movement from low frequency to high frequency? By the way, uh, I mentioned before, this makes sense only when you have boundary data because if you're considering a similar problem, think about the NLS again, um, in R2, for example, in RD, we have scattering. So that means that the solution U as T goes to plus or minus infinity becomes basically linear. And um, we can see a lot more about that. So because it's more a linear behavior. So this is purely a nonlinear situation. And that's why we'll, we'll work on the torus. Um, OK, so one way of thinking about um, this quantity, how it grows, is by hitting with a weight, k, which will emphasize whether you are actually moving to large k. And then you sum all of the k's. This is the approach that I learned from Bourguin originally. And now it turned out to be that this is the HS norm square. So that's why people look at the um, asymptotic behavior of higher Sobolin norms. Why higher? Well, if S is zero, that's the L2 norm, that's the mass we know is conserved. If S is one, in the defocusing case, this will be just the kinetic, uh, related to the kinetic energy. And so you have a bound for it. So it really starts making sense when S is larger uh, than one. So this is a purely, understanding this uh, limit here, and this is not gonna be the content of the talk, um, has been done mostly in a deterministic manner uh, using PDE approach. This is the original work of Brugan, and then many other people, I just wrote a few of them here. And then there is uh, some computational uh, numerical um, experimentation in this direction. I also wrote some of the names here. And very, very, very interesting approach, which is more uh, from the dynamical system point of view. And there's a very strong school in Italy that is working on this intensely. And I wrote some names here. And I'm happy to talk more about that, but this is not going to be the point of the talk. Um, okay. So the approach to which I will concentrate upon today. Um, says the following. If we are interested on understanding the behavior of this quantity, which now will rename NKT, which is the magnitude of U or the Fourier coefficient of U square, wouldn't be great if we actually have an equation that this quantity NK satisfies. So, um, well, this is uh, the so called wave kinetic equation and is part of this larger umbrella. Um, called wave turbulence theory. And it is the effective equation for this quantity. Now, how do you derive an equation for this NKT or the Fourier coefficient square? Well, um, from uh, I will actually give you um, the formal derivation first, which you find, for example, in the physics book of Nazarenko. And then I will tell you that it is much more complicated if you wanted to go from the formal derivation to the rigorous derivation. But loosely speaking, what's going to happen is you start with your original equation. You assume that the nonlinearity is actually weak. So you have a parameter in front of, in front of it. It's called a lambda or epsilon. It's going to go to 0. And then you approximated this uh, equation in certain ways. and. Uh, you will see coming up this uh, um, equation, this wave kinetic equation, which um, actually governs quite a lot of uh, experimentation that has been done in many different fields, including uh, climate research and uh, um, all sorts of atmospheric models and all of that. Um, so it's very important. And the first uh, places where you can see um, the starting of this derivation and the writing of this kind of equation in the, uh, in the work of Perls, uh, Hasselman. Actually, Hasselman got a Nobel Prize a couple of years ago in physics for his study of climate. And he, and you can already start seeing what I will show later to be um, Feynman diagrams attached to this. 
and uh, and so on um a lot of more people and uh, nazarenko is, has a book uh, on this which is uh, uh, where i learned the derivation from which i will show to you at least very briefly okay so the equation that i will consider today is the zakharov kuznetsov equation for the zk equation which is the same one that nazarenko uses in his book for the derivation of the wave kinetic equation but um, as I will mention later on, there is a very uh, large literature for the NLS equation. And you then here is definitely one of the main people that we work with, as you will see in a moment. So let me try to parse for you, what is this? This, it's really a higher or multi-dimensional KDV type equation. In fact, if you're looking at dimension one, that means that here you just have the derivative order three, and this is derivative with respect to t, derivative order three, and down here is the quadratic nonlinearity derivative of the square. So that's just the KDV in one dimension, but there is a higher dimension version, which is this, which you can uh, consider as I'm doing here. And this is the lambda in front of the nonlinearity, the nonlinearity is quadratic, and our lambda is going to be going to go to zero. You define this equation in a box of size d, and uh, capital D if you want here. And um, let's think of NKT to be the magnitude of the Fourier coefficient square where phi now is a solution. Now, I put this in quotation mark because as you will read here, the type of derivation that you will do needs probability. So really at the end of the day, this is gonna be the expectation of the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient square, okay? I didn't write it that yet, but that's what you should think about. Uh, another important quantity to keep in mind is uh, this kinetic time. So the kinetic time is of the order lambda minus two, where lambda is the small coefficient in here. And this tau is gonna be an absolute constant, but it's gonna be small. And uh, uh, as I will show you how you go from this equation to something like this. So you, you uh, actually, again, you will have to use some probabilities so here, really there is the expectation. And then what, this is, you can do this formally and I will show you in a second in a couple of slides. And then from here, you take the limit as d goes to infinity, lambda goes to zero, and there it pops your equation. So I'm gonna tell you in the next slides what Q is, what this operator is, but that's how it looks like. So the derivative with respect to tau now, because I'm looking with respect to this constant one, equals some nonlinear version. Uh, in fact, that Q is called the convolution operator. And this is the shape. Now, it's not important that the, you, know, you understand exactly all the pieces of this, but there are a couple of points that I wanted to, to make. So um, this delta function is in terms of the dispersion relation. The dispersion relation for this equation is of the following type. So think about taking the nonlinear operator, which is derivative with respect to x in the first direction, and then the Laplacian. So the derivative with respect to the first direction, direction in the Fourier world will give you the first component of the frequency k. And the Laplacian will give you the absolute value square of the frequency k. So this is the dispersion relation to compare with the Schroeder, which is in just the absolute value of k square. There is not this term here. And this is w here, just an expression of the case that comes in there because there is a not, not the derivative of nonlinearity. But not if you are working on the like lattice, this is sine k. Okay, yeah, correct. And I'm going to do exactly. So this is, uh, um, and you then is completely correct. This form here is what you will see in the derivation of Nazarenko, where he considers the zk equation in the continuum. So we are in the in the box everywhere. Later on, you will see that the, um, the equation will be discretized. Hence, the dispersion relation will take a different shape, even more complicated, but at the moment we are on the continuum, so I'm gonna write this one. Okay, good. So, um, so this is the delta function and uh, uh, the omega is here. And I will uh, remark towards the end of the talk about this delta function here, which has to be um, taken in a, in a particular way because you have to make sense of it mathematically. But this is what you obtain if you do sort of a, uh, formal derivation. This delta tells you that you're really doing convolution because k1 is equal to k2, k3. 
And one other thing to remark is that this is quadratic. There is a, just the product of two um, ends because we are working in uh, for a, with an equation that has a quadratic nonlinearity. If you, for example, are looking at the Schrodinger equation, which is cubic, here you will see three ends instead of. But there is a similar version of this that you derive for the Schrodinger equation as well. Uh, and this is what I remarked in the last thing because we are we have a quadratic nonlinearity. This collision operator is quadratic as well. But it's called the three wave kinetic equation because there are three waves involved the outcome one and the K2 and K3. Okay. So, so far, all of this, uh, sorry, I'm just zoom out this stuff. Kind of doesn't move at all. <laughs> okay, let's see. It's frozen. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, guys. Good. All right. Okay. Sorry, we were a few times. So let me talk a little bit about the um, derivation of that equation, the, 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 the wave kinetic equation. So this is what you find in the book on Nazarenko. And I, I wanted to show you this because I wanted to compare with what you have to do if instead you have to derive uh, rigorously. So we start with a little normalization. This is just because there is a derivative and the nonlinearity and you wanted to get to normalize. Don't worry too much about that, but it's really the Fourier uh, coefficient of the solution normalized with respect to the first component of your frequency k. Now, what you wanna find first is um, you think of a k, which is uh, the solution of your equation in the frequency world, in the Fourier world, if you like, as a, a sum of terms that uh, are indexed or they are in terms of the powers of lambda. So there is uh, the power zero of lambda, the power, the coefficient attached to the power one of lambda, the coefficient attached to the power two of lambda, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, these guys, A, K, I, I stands for this uh, index up here connected with the lambda, um, has to, is such that uh, when you take the sum, this has to solve the equation I started with. Now, this equation that I started with is the one that uh, they think about KDV, take Fourier transform, and then normalize. That's what you get. Okay, so now you start plugging in this AK and you try to figure out what these different terms should look like. The first one attached with the lambda to the power zero is just the initial datum, nothing there. The second one, the one attached with the power lambda, has this expression, okay? Now, it's not important what V is, it's some power of K1, uh, some uh, function of K1, K2, and K uh, explicitly, but uh, it's not important for now. And then here, this uh, I wanted to just uh, tell you what this uh, frequency, this um, power, this uh, expression here. So this is the, uh, for the dispersion relation at K1 plus the one at K2 minus the one at K. And I wanted to emphasize that I wanted to represent this, uh, um, this expression by, by using um, a graph. This is a typical Feynman graph. And so the frequency K right here is written in terms of K1 and K2. And that's what I'm gonna do. Now the next term, which is the one of power lambda two, it's more complicated, but again, you plug it in and now you're gonna see the following. You have that K is again K1 and K2, <coughs> But then K1 is going to be split in K3 and K4. So you see this sort of, we call it ladder graphs. No, us just calling this is uh, some original work of other people that I will mention in a second. But in principle, you can keep going. You can think of this also being the UML expansion, if you like. And there are these powers here of V to the I and so on in terms of sigma and S, which are the times. The point is that uh, what Nazarenko says, we stop here. This is enough for us to derive the equation. We don't need any other power except up to the lambda two. And that's connected with the kinetic time, which is lambda to the minus two. 
Okay, so you, you do a little bit of math and you assume, this is all the math, you assume that you have some probability in here. This is a random phase, it's right here, it's written right here. So it's a, a random phase and amplitude. So what that means is that you are assume that both the phase, you write it in, uh, in terms of, if you like, a polar coordinates, and you assume that the phase is random, the amplitude is random independently. And you write down the expectation of this expression where you keep only powers of two of lambda and no more. So ignore everything else. And then you take, remember you are on a box of size D, capital D, you take that go to infinity and then you take lambda go to zero and you obtain the equation. So that's, this is really the formal derivation. I didn't do for you the part of, you know, multiplying the expression of these guys and using the, uh, the, the randomness of the independence, but basically up to that point, this is what you do formally to obtain this equation down here. And note that uh, in this argument, basically, you only consider this type of Feynman diagram. It's very simple and very few. Okay, now um, let me give you a little bit uh, the mathematical literature here. And then I'm gonna um, go more into details of what we did in order to derive what we did formally in a, a rigorous manner. So I wanna start with the original work of Erdos Yao and er er Erdos Schalmofer and Yao. Uh, some of you might know these people, they are really, really important uh, math physicists. And they consider the linear Schrodinger on a lattice. This is what you then was talking about before. Um, so you discretize, you, you have the uh, linear Schrodinger, you discretize in your uh, uh, box of size D, and, uh, and then you start taking these limits that I mentioned, but in a more, yes. The, this other Shia or other sample of Yao was in the RD semi, if I'm correct. I think the later Lucanian Schwann was lattice. Okay, so this is an RD? I think so. Okay, great. So it's in the continuum. Yeah. yeah. But they already start looking at the uh, Feynman graphs in their dual expansion, if you want. Yeah, thank you. All right, so it's linear though. Linear, but with, of course, there's a potential. Otherwise, you know, we know everything about it. So there is a potential in there. Um, they do the, the expansion, they take the limits, and they go beyond, in fact, the uh, kinetic time, which is lambda to minus two. They go to the lambda minus two minus epsilon. Now, the first result that I know of in the nonlinear case, and this is for the cubic NLS, and this is, this is discretized in the way I was saying, so it's in the lattice setting. Uh, but what they consider is a very special type of probability that you put on this context. And this probability is given by a measure which is invariant for this equation. This is the Gibbs Nash. So we say we, they are at equilibrium and they obtain um, some linearized kinetic equation at the kinetic time. So that's, uh, that's an important. And then the, the kind of the, the things were dormant for a little while until there is a um, very important work by Buckmaster, Germain, Hani, and Chatin, and they consider the nonlinear Schrodinger in the continuous case. So it's not on the lattice, it's in the continuum. Um, and they, um, they use a different approach than the one of uh, uh, Luperin and Spohn. And they obtain um, they did the limit, but before the kinetic time. So before this lambda to the minus two. And uh, Colo Germain and uh, uh, Yudang and Hani, um, after this work, they continued the, 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 the study and they got almost to the kinetic time. And in fact, um, Yudang and Hani achieved that in this uh, sort of monumental work here at the kinetic time, the nonlinear uh, case. So this is really what uh, uh, the end game was. Now, um, the, 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 in their work, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, the uh, lambda and the size of the box, which here I call L, are related to each other in a, in a certain, with respect to a certain power alpha. Now, there is some work which uh, uh, we just uh, heard um, private communication by Tulu Karin and Voxena. They also consider the nonlinear Schrodinger, but in the lattice case, so in the discretized uh, model. 
and uh, they seem to have obtained also the kinetic, um, uh, the wave kinetic equation, the kinetic time. And I also want to mention the work by uh, this uh, um, younger junior mathematician. He's a student of, uh, of uh, UNESCO at Princeton. He also considered the ZK equation that we, we consider in the continuum case. And uh, um, by adding dissipation, I also obtain the wave kinetic equation, but before the kinetic time. Okay, so this I think is uh, what I wanted to say in terms of the history. So as you can see in this page, there has been quite a lot of activities on this direction in the recent years. Now our result, finally. Um, so this equation looks a little bit different than what I wrote before. In fact, it's written as a stochastic PE. <coughs> Why is that? Well, we have to add the noise. So this green part was the one that we had before, but now here we have to add the noise, so a stochastic term, and then there's initial data. And I, I would like to, I will say quite a lot about this, but for now, just bear with me in, uh, with the notation. So the lambda is still the parameter that will go to zero. In front of this noise, which is written in a strange way, but this is when you translate it into the Fourier world, it's just the uh, Stakhanovich type of plot. Um, and the constant here in front is actually depending on lambda as well. So when lambda goes to zero, this part also disappears. The setting is uh, like the one of Lucarin and Spon, which is discretized. So we're going to discretize this equation um, in the Fourier transform, so it's going to be a little bit easy to parse. But the box that I'm talking about, which is given by the parameter capital D, it's actually uh, discrete, so just points, because this is a discretized equation. All right, so once we, look, we move on to the Fourier world, then unfortunately, as you then announced before, the uh, dispersion relation becomes even more complicated. So before it, in the continuum, there will be the first component of the vector K, and then here will be the vector K square. But when you are in a lattice, those, uh, uh, those terms become appear with a sign, which is even worse. And then down here, I just wrote something in terms of what the noise is like, but it's not really important. It's uh, um, for now you can ignore that, but you can uh, uh, you can make sense of it in the in the Fourier world. Uh, as you do that. Okay, so uh, one thing to keep in mind because I will be talking a lot about it is this guy here, and which unfortunately, unfortunately is very singular. So we do. The beginning, at least, is just like what uh, Nazarenko does in his book. We look at the Fourier, uh, at the Fourier coefficient. We normalize them again. So now here, this represents the sign of the first component down here. And uh, um, this is just a way of writing the same equation. And what we are interested on is, in fact, this quantity. This, in other words, is the expectation of the Fourier coefficient. It has been renormalized a little bit, but that's what it is. This is called the two-point correlation function. And it's really the, uh, the expectation in terms of this uh, um, probability measure of the Fourier coefficient square. This is another way of writing that uh, more. So we wanted to understand, we wanted to derive an equation for this quantity here. And uh, I wrote this thing in purpose in uh, emphasizing this row, this density, because our work diverges from uh, uh, what the previous works have done in terms of the fact that instead of looking at the evolution of the U, the, of U or the A, if we look at the Fourier world, we look, uh, we use quite a lot the, the evolution of the, um, of the density function. And this is something that uh, um, was not the way we done before. So let me give you a rough statement of the theorem. So suppose the dimension is greater or equal to two, to the two point correlation function, which really is the expectation of the free coefficient square. And we call F for my equation CK with the added noise though. Um, and which is defined in an upper cube like lattice, which just means that you are in the discrete world, can be asymptotically expressed uh, via the three wave kinetic equation, which I already introduced for you. But this is why is this is a rough statement because I'm not telling at all how it is asymptotically expressed, how, what kind of limit we are really 
taking. But one thing that I wanted to uh, stress is that uh, um, in this argument, we do in fact take first the limit as d goes to infinity and then the limit as lambda goes to zero and they are independent from each other. Now you might ask, why do you do this in the, this, this, this discretized manner, which makes things even more complicated? And correctly, we should not have been doing that. We should have been in the continuum where things are easier. But we were following closely the work of Lucarin and Spohn, and they did that for their um, NLS. So it seemed to be what the physicists want to see, and that's why we, we did this. But definitely, you could be in the continuum as well. Actually, things are slightly simpler. Now, the dispersion relation. Um, I, I wrote this again for you. We saw it before. One thing to remark is that, unfortunately, this becomes zero in many places, in fact, they're an upper plane. And it's uh, uh, what makes, besides the fact that we look in the, the, in the lattice, what makes the problem harder is the fact that this is zero in many places, com compared to NLS, for example, where this is zero only at one point. So again, there is another complication. So the noise that we add, so I told you there is a, this stochastic part in there. So why did you have to put that in there? Well, one first easier uh, way to understand why you had to put it is because a lot of the wave interaction happens in this hyperplane where the first component is zero. And if you don't have a mechanism to kick these frequencies away from this uh, hyperplane, just there is not enough movement to get to the wave kinetic equation. So there is not enough interaction to get to that, at least not in within the, um, the lambda minus two uh, kinetic time that we want. So um, the noise is doing the job of moving this frequency that get trapped in this hyperplane away and uh, um, allow us to prove that there is do have an equation. Of course, mathematically, this you, <laughs> the way you see that the, the, the noise helps comes in a second. So um, I mentioned already that the density function rho is an extremely important um, function for us to study in this, uh, um, in this, uh, this problem. So let me just uh, write for you the equation for it. So let's think of A to be the um, Hamiltonian. So this is the kinetic part, and then there is potential part. Remember, there is a lambda in front of the nonlinear. So I will do it again here. So now we introduce, well, we write a K as is a real and imaginary part. And these two real imaginary parts are two processes. And if you just write it down, what the equation is supposed to satisfy, something like this. Now, we start with uh, at time zero, there is a certain density, we'll give it that to you. We wanted to understand how this moves in times because we are writing, we are looking at an expectation which is based on this uh, density that changes, which was different than the, um, in fact, the case of uh, Luca and Spohn where they use something uh, related to the Gibbs measure, which is invariant. So there is a way of writing the equation for all. And this is what we call the Liouville equation, the focal punk uh, equation. There are many names for this. And it's explicit. You can write like that. And I didn't write explicitly this H here, but that's not really relevant for now. What's important to note is the fact that this CR is the part that comes attached with the noise. So that means that this is the piece that you gain. And if you think about it, this is an operator order two with the right sign. So obviously there is some smoothing happening here, sort of like a dissipation, if you like. Um, so the, there is another paper that we have in where we study this, this equation itself. But for now, let's assume that you have nice solutions and you're, you're OK with that. So let me. Um, write the equation in a polar coordinates because I wanted to make a couple of remarks. So we write the um, variables in, as a um, the amplitude and uh, um, here the angle. And then we rewrite the equation in terms of those variables. And we see what I announced before, we have this comes from the noise and this is now the square, right? So derivative square. So this is uh, um, dissipation. So in, but it's only in terms of the angle. 
So one remark that I wanted to make is that by assuming that you add this stochastic this, you improve on the angle, not on the magnitude. This is the reason why um, does not appear in the final wave kinetic equation, which is only concerning with the magnitude. So there is no, no angle in there. That's why this noise it's, uh, um, is doing the right job. Okay, so um, why do we care about these equations? We care about these equations because um, by um, using it, we are able to find a priori estimates uniform in time for the evolution of rock. So those, this is the equation that allows us to keep things under control in time um, by using this one. So this is a little bit uh, uh, restatement of the main theorem, which is a little bit more uh, uh, precise. So we start with uh, the two point correlation function, which I introduced before. And this, if you want, you can call this with notation NKT, which I, I wrote at the beginning. And again, we are in dimension better or equal than two. And we, I didn't write here, but with the assumption for, for time zero of the density, which are pretty mild, like a momentum being uh, bounded, then we are able to prove exactly at the right time, which is the kinetic time, this limit. Now, again, I'm gonna put here quotation marks because you know there are many different ways you can uh, uh, write this limit with, and uh, it's actually not so simple and it's pretty weak uh, type of limit. And I will uh, emphasize at the end why the, we are not, well, we cannot prove stronger type of limits than, uh, um, for example, can be proved for the Schrodinger equation. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of an idea why you have, um, you have to be careful. Okay, so in, in some ingredients of the proof. So unfortunately, just like the paper of Yudeng and the Zahir Hani, also our paper, this paper, unfortunately long, not as long as the uh, GR, general relativity paper, which is good, but uh, so I'm trying to summarize here just the main parts of it. Um, I mentioned already the properties of the Liouville equation, which is the equation that allows us to keep things under control. The Duhamel expansion via the Feynman diagrams, I gave you a little bit of an idea when uh, I, I was mentioning the formal derivation of Nazarenko, but there you saw only two very simple graphs. Here, when you do the derivation, you have to consider all the powers lambda to the n. So when you combine all of them, the kind of graphs that come are many and they're comp different complexity. So you have to try to sort through that. Um, but that's the way we know how to do it so far. Um, the study of this graph and the difficulties that comes from the singularity of the dispersion relation, unfortunately, and then we separate the graphs into leading graphs. Those who are exactly the ones that give us, when we look at them, the equation that we want at the end, and then other graphs, which are non-leading graphs, that we have to send to zero when lambda goes to zero and the, the, the box goes to infinity. Um, and then um, there is, a, to make things worse, when we do that, we know, we knew already that there was a counterexample that was telling us that the, the type of estimates could not happen the way we hoped, and that's a, a counterexample of Karin. And, and finally, the, the notion of resonant broadening, and I will tell you where it comes. Okay, so um, uh, the key property, which I already mentioned before, that we use about the density function and the equation um, are the moments bounds. So things that keeps uh, the dynamics under control as we uh, move in time. And uh, I wanted to contrast this with the fact that uh, Lucarino and Spohn in their um, derivations in the, uh, the equilibrium, they had to make the assumptions that certain things were uniformly bounded. So they call that assumption is called L1 cluster estimate. If anybody had read that paper, that's what it is. And that assumption was only proved in a special situation later. So in particular, the result is conditional in a sense. So by not using uh, their argument, but instead concentrating and using the Liouville equation for directly how the density function changes and uh, 
um, in time, we are able to avoid this assumption. And in fact, that uh, this a priori bounds are derived from the equation itself. So this is a one big difference with the work on Karim and so on. Then, as I mentioned already, so in the formal derivation that I just gave to you, these are the kind of graphs that we see. This is called the ladder graphs. And these are, you know, if you keep continuing, that's exactly what gives you the, um, the uh, wave kinetic equation. So this is done by ignoring everything that it's a border greater than two. But of course, when you do the formal, you go from the formal to the rigorous derivation, you have to look at all the terms that comes from all the powers of n. And if you start writing associated with your expansion, the graphs that come from it, you have a bunch of different ones, not just these ones, which are called big graphs. And the combinatorial, you have to do quite a lot of combinatorial work in order to, um, to, to deal with it. So um, in a sense, we would like to say that our work it kind of builds on top of what the, the setting that the uh, Erdos, Sandhofer, and Yao did for the linear with potential and look at in a spawn, which consists in the following. So you have seen in the, in the little uh, formal derivation that I gave, you have seen the first one, it was the initial data. The second one has an integral in time. The third one has two integral in times, but now you have to imagine that to be extended at all levels. So at some point you say, okay, I'm gonna stop. And this, <clears throat> you stop this expansion at uh, layer M, that of course we depend on Lambda, right? We, we, we saw that uh, we only expanded twice, but if you keep going, that depends on Lambda. And then you have to let this uh, number go to infinity. Okay, so then what you wanna do is uh, um, to split the, the, the graphs into those that will actually give you the equation and the remaining ones. And for the remaining ones have a bound of the type lambda to the theta and then some function that depends on this large number here. And of course, this theta has to be strong enough to kill the growth of that. And that's not uh, a simple task, but let me just give you um, the very, very high um, view of the, of the situation. So we classify all these different graphs that come into leading graphs and non-leading graphs. These ones are the ones that you combine and gives you the equation and you, you keep them, of course. And then these other ones are the ones that you wanna to send to zero. And here I just give you a, a little representation of one of the graphs that are considered to be leader. So in the sense, you see it's kind of going down um, like a ladder and not twisting somehow um, inside itself. So um, those are the ones that we keep because they give the equation. Now, uh, unfortunately for the non-leading one, we have to deal with the singularity that comes from the uh, dispersed relation. And I mentioned already that there is this uh, upper plane where, which is the one where omega is zero, where too many frequencies get trapped. And for those, if you actually, so when I say trapped, that's the physical word for it. But when you do the mathematics, what happens is that you have to do oscillatory integrals. And when the, the frequency, the, the, the omega is zero, there is nothing oscillating and you really cannot do anything unless you have the noise. So in the, this non-leading graphs where there is this ghost, we call it ghost manifold where we have all the singularity. It's not just omega equals zero, we have to remove a few more points, but in any case. So in here, we have no oscillation that we can use. It just, there's nothing we can do. So we have to use the noise and that's, um, that part is done with that. And then the non-leading graphs where the, um, man, the this ghost manifold is not effective, we just do uh, normal kind of oscillatory integrals, estimate and we can conclude that part. So again, I wanted to emphasize, I mentioned this before that uh, the in the limit, in the wave kinetic equation, we don't see the noise because as I mentioned, that acts only in the angle. And this guy, this equation, it's only in the amplitude. So there's no interfere. <clears throat> but I also want to say that the noise that we put maintains the L2 conserved and uh, um, it does not um, interact, or does not 
um, kill the nonlinearity. So you have to be very clever in what kind of noise you can put there. You cannot just put anything because you might actually kill everything and don't get anything at all. Okay. So let me um, um, talk a little bit about what I mentioned. So the counterexample. So following Erdos Yao um, and also Lucarin and uh, and um, and. Um, on, um, we have to, from the graphs, there are, and I didn't write for you, but from the graph, you can uh, write down what is the type of estimate you have to do. There is a name for this, they call it crossing and nesting estimates. And the problem is that uh, um, we have to adjust this kind of integral estimates because we already know from the work of Lucarin that uh, the type of dispersion relation that we have is exactly the one that give a counterexample. So I will mention this a little bit more in detail in a moment. So that's a big issue. Now, um, there is another issue, which is uh, still related to the fact that omega is singular, which is when you have, you keep all your ladder, so the parts <laughs> that uh, contribute to the equation, you still have to take limits there. And unfortunately, um, you would like to say that a certain object is a measure and really it's not. And you have to uh, just analytically does not make sense again, because the omega is singular. So we need to figure out how to um, handle that as well. So let me um, say a little bit few more words on this. So the big bad news number one is the counterexample. Like I said, this, uh, there is a whole paper, in fact, of Lucarino that we discovered when we got stuck that says that if uh, omega k, the dispersion relation, um, needs to suppress crossing, in other words, it uh, um, uh, behaves well when you wanted to do certain estimates, then it cannot be constant on any affine hyperplane. And this is exactly what happens for the omega in this uh, KDV type equations. So a counterexample uh, for this was uh, exactly of the type where omega is this expression here. So clearly one has to do something else in there. And uh, um, another thing that uh, um, seems not um, uh, a, first, a first try might not seem a problem at all, the fact that you have a bilinear nonlinearity instead of trilinear nonlinearity. But unfortunately, it is an issue. In fact, in the NLS, when you have uh, the cubic nonlinearity, at the end, when you do your estimate, you can use an L3 norm, for example, which decays. If you do the same thing for the equation that I have been looking at, at the end, because the quadratic nonlinearity, you will end up with an L2 norm. But the L2 norm is conserved, so there is no decay whatsoever. So even the bilinear estimate is going to be a problem. Now, the noise cannot fix this because, um, in fact, the noise does not appear in all the different graphs, as I mentioned before. It's only not in some of them. So clearly, you have to do something else. And that's where the weakness of the final limit comes from, because you have to make up for this. You have to diff use different norms in order to compute. Okay. Now, the bad news number three. <laughs> Um, the convergence of the leading graphs. So um, the, um, what's the problem? So the main problem is, so at the end, you have a, a, the piece that you want it to be exactly the equation, and you want it to take these limits. Now, you want it to make sense of a certain measure. Um, so if you remember in the equation in the, um, the Q, in the operator Q, there was a delta function, which was delta of omega one, omega two minus omega three or something like that. So that delta function with the omega in there of the singularity that we have here actually makes no sense. So you cannot take the limit, it's just too singular for that. So to be a little bit more precise, this is what happened. So at the end of the day, so if you remember when uh, um, I, uh, I wrote the derivation, um, at least the formal one, there, there, there were combinations of these omegas. So at the end, when you take the limit, you would like to claim the following equality, that if you take a um, uh, function f, a test function f, which is smooth enough, and you write this integral, 
you want it to be the same. These two things, you want it to be the same. So really you start from here. So you probably remember, from, I'm not sure, but about the formal derivation, there were some integral in times that had the S and then the multiplication of these omegas. So then if we look at Nazarenos, then it claims that they be, become delta function. But unfortunately, this is not, this equality is not true in general if omega is not regular enough. So I really, analytically, you cannot do that. So how do you fix this problem? Um, so we, we have a way of fixing by looking at what the physicists do. So that's a, a very, uh, very, very useful for us. Um, so the, the way we fix it is by using resonance broadening. And uh, analytically, this makes perfect sense. And it is done, could be done in different ways, but the way we did it is the following. So instead of defining the delta function in the way that we, we usually do, we, we have this little parameter L here. So we define delta L of omega K3 plus omega 2 minus omega K3 equals 1 over 2L, the integral from minus L and L. And the point is that there is this extra piece here. So this was what we had before that really cannot be made sense of, but now you have this little bit here, which actually makes sense. So the result, when you look at our theorem and you look at the limit, the way we compute it, it's not gonna have really delta function, but it's gonna be this delta L with this parameter L just strictly greater than zero. And this is just because the analysis, I mean, you know, certain times when you work with distribution and stuff, certain limits don't happen and you have to, so let me just uh, conclude. What are other things that we can do? So for example, I gave you two approaches. The first one was totally deterministic and it's really the asymptotic behavior of the HS norm. And there is a whole lot of mathematics going on in there because there are no sharp results in that situation. In any case, that's one approach. And then I give you the second approach, which is derivation of the equation that is uh, at least the expectation of the Fourier coefficient square should satisfy. So how do we want to link these two things? Of course, it depends. This is something that happens at t goes to infinity. This is something that happens in the kinetic time. So we have to think about that. Um, what happens past the kinetic time, lambda to the minus two, this was done in the linear case, but so far, as far as I know, in the nonlinear case, we don't know. Um, there is also a quantistic version of this. There's a quantistic version of the wave kinetic equation, um, formal, only formal derivation so far. And I have some results on the equation itself with uh, uh, my postdoc, Matt Frosenweg. And can one derive this equation um, uh, not just formally, but rigorously? Um, what about wave kinetic equation for our other dispersion system? Um, Yudeng and Zahair and uh, other people I mentioned worked on the NLS cubic. Uh, we've been, we did the KDD and so on, but there are other kinds of systems that are dispersed. So what is supposed to happen there? And finally, there is something to do with what we call homogeneous and inhomogeneous three-wave kinetic equations. With a recent paper with uh, um, Hanani, um, my postdoc, Matt and myself and Tran, we did the homogeneous just so for the ZK, again with noise. But uh, um, of course, there are a kind of equation that we should be looking at in order to do the homogeneous as well. So there is a lot of work to be done in here. And uh, with this, I'm going to stop. And uh, really thank you very much. Questions or comments? Um, so have you have you tried applying your method to other scaling laws? Say so again, have you have tried? you tried applying your, your method to other scaling laws? Other scaling laws. Uh, for, are you meaning for the lambdas? Yes, um, lambda and L. No, I mean we in our work the the L and the lambda are not connected. Yes, but what if they are connected? Um, I didn't think about that, okay. but uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's. Uh, you, you are thinking that maybe you can go further, further in time? Um, not quite, but uh, these are like uh, when, when, lambda, when the power between lambda and L is different, you get different uh, phenomena, basically. And I think you can get stronger limits as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, probably, yeah. I think that's, that certainly should be one consequence for sure. 
it may be other things as well, yes. but that for sure yes. is a consequence of yes. this. Yeah. Questions? Comments? Do we have some expectation after this kinetic, <laughs> like some rough? Idea. Yeah, so in the in the if I remember correctly, in the linear with potential, they um, they uh, see um, uh, is it dissipation like yes, this, yes. like the heat but, heat the heat equation. Yeah. Also, but yeah. in that case, it's very important you have uh, inhomogeneous problem. Exactly, inhomogeneous problem. Yeah. So there are some some um, conjectures. Uh, but they're also not sure. Conject I mean, you know, yes. So <laughs> am, I, am I representing it correctly? Yes. I mean, for the homogeneous wave equation, at least a four wave equation, probably it's most likely blows up. So yeah. we cannot so we can, kind of go beyond that. Right, exactly. So I also, I didn't mention this, but uh, um, there is a whole mathematics in understanding the wave kinetic equation itself. The singularities, when it makes sense, the blow ups, all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, and it's, in my view, it's remarkable how this equation is really used in all of this, uh, um, in many of this uh, um, numerical stuff and models for climates and so on. And uh, it's kind of uh, incredible that uh, you come up with that and they worked uh, before we knew actually they worked. So, yeah. It's, uh, so it works numerically. Yeah, that's. I mean, a, I least think we we I was this like the climate uh, model in Europe, uh, the European climate model that has a lot of the stuff in it. That's so Hesselman, and uh, that's what these people stuck with, and uh, has been very effective. I think. Yeah, and I should mention that uh, um, uh, you dang with the. Uh, Pusateri and uh, and UNESCO are actually working towards understanding these derivations in for the waterway problem, which is the real, the real problem. So, so real we can tell you more about that, but that's uh, that's that's the big thing, and it, but it's uh, highly nonlinear. So yeah, I like this. Uh, you, are, you agree with me that the Duhamel mm -hmm. thing is not working? That's not going to be. Other questions or comments? And if not, please come and have goodies and wine in the next door. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>